Okay, I think we are live and hopefully you're all coming into this virtual room. Hello everybody, welcome to this afternoon's Make for Tomorrow session. My name is Lucy, I work for um, Sussex Partnership Trust, I'm the Arts and Health Lead here. Um, our Arts and Health programme is called Make Your Mark. Um, if you've been here before, I'm sorry what I'm about to say you've heard a ma many times before, but for those of um, you that are new, um, so Make for Tomorrow is our current digital online participatory arts programme, which basically it means every week we've got different activities that um, is free and open to all adults across um, the trust. So um, if you enjoy this afternoon, which I'm sure you will, um, do please tell anyone else that you work with, any of your friends, families, anyone associated with the trust, everybody is welcome. So Make for Tomorrow is really just about connecting us through art um, and bringing us together in these rather strange um, and often quite challenging times. So the idea was that we would um, get lots of visual artists and also performers together to share something of their practice and their work with, with us all of, of, um, each week in different activities. Um, and it'd be a really good way for us to connect and hopefully bring a bit of um, joy and positivity into the week. So um, it's a partnership project. So it's not just the trust, we're doing it in partnership with some amazing organizations. One of which of course is Hospital Rooms, who if you've not come across them before, do check out their website, they're amazing. I'll introduce you to Phoebe in a minute. She's um, one of their project curators. She can tell you a little bit more, but in a nutshell, they work with really exciting visual artists to transform clinical spaces in different mental health care settings. Um, so they have been curating a big programme of all the different visual artists who've been contributing to Make for Tomorrow. We're also working with Arts Over Borders. They're also all about space, but they work with actors and performers and people from the world of film and television and theatre and um, literature. And they put on really interesting um, immersive events where you can experience um, performance in often in really unusual spaces. So they've been curating the performance and actor side of the programme. Um, and then also uh, our third partner is um, the brilliant COG app and they're a tech company. So we are in strange times. Of course, it always feels nicer to actually be able to meet in person, but in these days, that's just not possible. But COG app are amazing. They've helped us with all the technical side of Make for Tomorrow. They've pressed all the right buttons and got all the different um, processes and technological and digital things in place for us to all be able to be here, hopefully nice and smoothly and accessibly. Um, so this afternoon, we've got this really exciting workshop with a fantastic artist, Hannah Brown. She's going to be talking um, you through some uh, techniques around painting and landscapes. You'll meet her in a minute and she can tell you a bit more about what, what we're going to get up to. But I think that's about it from me. Um, just to say, I hope you have a lovely afternoon. I'm sure you will. Well, hopefully you've got your paints and your paintbrushes at the ready um, and yes enjoy I'll hand you over now to Phoebe from Hospital Rooms all right and I'll see you at the end bye for now hi Lucy thanks for that we've certainly got our um, paints at the ready and I'm here with my colleague Louis um, and we're both project curators at Hospital Rooms um, so we're super excited to have Hannah Brown with us today to lead a landscape painting workshop um, and as I said, Hostel Rooms, um, or as Lucy mentioned as well, Hostel Rooms is an organisation that transforms clinical spaces with extraordinary artworks through a series of participatory workshops and installations. So we worked with Hannah last year at the Hellingly Centre. So those of you from the Hellingly Centre joining us today will be very familiar with Hannah's work in the atrium, which um, has been Hannah's biggest painting yet. Um, and might be her own, her, her last biggest painting, who knows? <laughs> but we are really excited to have her today to go through um, a really nice landscape painting workshop and she'll show you how to structure your composition um, and how to add tones um, that you can see in this image. Um, and I think if you move along a few slides, so this, it'll be, this is the workshop. And you should have got an image um, with the workshop, a photograph of the landscape, or you can use your own. Um, so we're really looking forward to this. And just before I pass you over to Hannah, there's a few um, housekeeping notes. So just to say, we want to keep this really interactive and conversational. So any questions, comments, thoughts, anything you would like, pop it in the Q&A box at the bottom and Louis and I will feed it back to Hannah. Um, this is being recorded, but there'll be no one visible or audible apart from Hannah um, and the host rooms team. And that's just for security and privacy reasons. I think that's it for me. So um, yes, we're very much looking forward to it. We've got the paints at the ready. So let's um, hand over to Hannah. Thank you. Hi, Hannah. <laughs> Hello. 
Sorry, I didn't know if it was showing me or not. <laughs> it I, is. I can see you still highlighted. There you are. <laughs> Sorry about that. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us and thank you very much for that introduction. Um, as Phoebe said, I'm going to go through um, a landscape painting workshop. Um, the workshop is, um, well, I'm going to show you how I approach landscape painting, but this is just one approach. It's the one that I know. Um, and there's no right or wrong ways to do anything. So you can either follow along or um, do it a slightly different way, ask me questions. It's just um, a guide of one approach. And I, as I said, there's no right or wrong approach. I think the most important thing with painting is to enjoy it and to not worry about it too much. So I'm going to go through first the materials that we will be using. This is a primed piece of heavyweight um, cartridge paper. Um, yours doesn't have to be primed. And I don't know that it makes much difference. I hoped it would, but actually it's about the same. Um, so working on paper with acrylics, it can wrinkle a little bit, but um, I don't think that's too much of a problem. So we've got paper and masking tape. This is the type that I use. It's a low tack tape for delicate surfaces, but any masking tape should do the job. And I've got off to the side the acrylic paints. This is quite a standard acrylic set. So it comes with cool yellows and warm yellows and the same with red, some nice browns, just one premixed green and a blue. But any colors that you want to use are absolutely fine. And what else have we got? Got a pot for the water to swill wash the brushes out in and another pot for clean water um, so ideally when you brush your put your brush in the water to dilute the paint you're using the clean one and then you wash it out in this tub and then I also have a small pot where I put it when it's got too muddy but I'm quite good at forgetting which pot's which and just dunking the paint brush anywhere so that's the system but it might not work I've also got brushes um, in different sizes and the trusty kitchen roll. Can't do anything without kitchen roll. Oh, I can't, I'm so messy. So um, the first thing to do is to tape around the edges of the paper with the masking tape. Um, and this has two uses. The first use is that it keeps it flat on the table because as you can see, my paper has curled up and that makes it easier to paint. But it also means at the end, we can pull it up and then you have quite a nice border. So I put it down between five to seven mil from the edge, but you might want a slightly thinner border or slightly thicker border, that's up to you. So we go around the edges. I also tend to put one piece um, a bit further in because this is a piece of paper which is I think A4 but it's quite nice to have it not a regular paper size or I find it quite nice to do it a slightly odd size. It's a pain for framing because the frames come in standard sizes but um, and I also prefer a format which is just slightly squarer rather than um, a longer rectangle but that is entirely up to you. So that's the last piece up there. So this reference image that I'm using, um, you might have a different image. And um, if you do, I'll try and talk through steps that might be the equivalent, equivalent in your landscape 
image. Um, this one that I'm using, it's of a place in Mid Devon called Uton, which is, um, Crediton is where I grew up and where my parents live. And this particular place was the first landscape I really engaged with in that I kept returning to, to paint. It's the first landscape I fell properly in love with. And I've been there many times over the years and it changes quite a lot. Um, and I have a huge fondness for it. So that's why I chose it today. Um, because for me to paint a landscape is in some ways to have it for yourself, to make it your own. Um, and it's a way of remembering what it was like to be there, to stand there, to feel yourself being in nature, which I find really calming. Um, and so I really enjoy painting um, this image in particular. So we're going to start off with the sky. Um, first of all, I need to squeeze out a few paints. If I do them across the top here, then you can see them. And I'm just pouring out the water for the brushes. Hannah, we've just had a question come in just asking if you've painted this landscape before and is it a landscape that you regularly go back to to, to explore? Um, it is, yes, I have painted it before. I painted it, um, I made a series, I first started doing it I think in about 2010 or 11 and I've returned to painting it regularly over that time and most times when I go to Devon I try to go to this particular field. Even if I'm not going to paint it, I just, I, I have to, pilgrimage is maybe too grand a term to put, but it's, it's something which um, I, I like to go back there um, and check in on it. Great. Um, so as far as squeezing the paints out goes, I tend to not like the warm yellows so much. So I'm discarding that one, or not discarding it, but just not paint, squeezing it out. But you, know, you can use whatever tones or colors you prefer. And it's the same with the cadmium red. I don't use much red. I mostly use green. Um, so I'm gonna squeeze out as a bit of lemon yellow. And the yellow okra. And then I have an emerald green here. I use a lot of sap green usually. Um, I paint with acrylics for my large paintings underneath and I do oil painting. And this format of painting I usually do as a sketch to decide whether I want to work with an image or not. So it's part of my editing process to, I always work from photographs. And so to take the photographs and just to decide which one will become a painting. And so this is, it's quite quick. Um, as you'll see, there's quite a lot of freedom in, I don't maybe paint it exactly as it is. And I make things up change things, which I think is what's so brilliant about landscape painting, because no one will ever know. <laughs> <laughs> so it gives a lot of leeway. We actually had someone who just asked um, the question, do you always use um, photos as a reference? So you've just answered that. <laughs> yes, I do. I have tried painting plain air and um, I just can't seem to settle on a particular view. There's just too many decisions. So I find the photograph is a really good way of um, framing and cropping the image. And I can um, take it back to the studio and be a bit more objective and not sort of sit where the patch of sunlight is. Cause otherwise I might just patch, sit and paint the view which is the nicest bit to sit in the field or uh, <laughs> where I don't think a cow will come in. Cause I'm <laughs> terrified of the idea of a cow trampling over me. Um, <laughs> So I'm mixing up a color for the sky and I don't tend to paint the skies blue, but don't let that stop you. Um, it's just that I found over the years when I paint it blue, um, it looks just a bit too much like a traditional landscape. So this is my way of trying to 
carve out a little bit of territory for myself within the huge weighty history of landscape painting. Um, and I also like that it asks a few questions. It could be a odd time of day or um, it could be pollution, light pollution that you get from the city or um, just leaves things a little bit more open. So I'm just putting it over the sky quite quickly with the, a larger brush. Um, don't worry too much about this. Tend to put a bit of white down towards where the tree line will be because it sets off the trees nicely. If you want to put clouds in, please do. I'd love to see the paintings that you make. So I think that's done. It's a bit darker um, in the studio, so it actually looks better on the screen, which is nice. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to wash out that brush in the correct pot for once at least. You'll probably forget next time because acrylic dries really quickly. So um, can't leave your brushes around for too long. And then after washing it out, I blot it in the tissue paper or the kitchen roll and then leave that to the side. So now that we've done the sky, the next section I'm going to do so this first part of the workshop really takes it through in, in sections, sections, but then after a while, there's a lot more freedom to do it in any order. Um, the next part I'm doing is the river running through the center. So if you're not using this image, um, I would choose something that's in the, um, the middle ground that recedes that you want to um, view as being behind the foreground. Um, so it might be a road or a path. Um, and by painting this first, when we paint the section here, the grass, it should look like it's in front because the eye can read the order that the paint was put down. So for this, I'm going to use another brush, which is quite big. Uh, just looking for one of my favorite brushes. Um, and a color, a rich brownie um, color with a little bit of blue. So the burnt umber with a little bit of ultramarine would work well for this. And just very loosely plan out that area that will be the water a bit later on. You might want to make it a little bit darker over the top. And if you do that in places and not over the whole section, then you get areas that will read as highlights in the water. And the bottom right of the image is darker. So I'm just adding a bit of darker paint there, a bit of black. You can go under where the foreground will be a little bit and then rinse the brush out again. Do let me know if I'm going too fast. Um, we've, we've had quite a few questions, but okay. I, do you want me to ask them now or is there a better point to... You can ask them now. Okay. Well, we had um, someone who um, asked at the beginning um, that, well, just to say that she loved hearing about your landscape and do you ever paint at the actual spot, which is um, what you've spoken about with plein air um, yeah. painting. Um, but you obviously took the photograph. So what's the experience like of being there as well? Um, I sometimes sketch at the actual spot 
and um, I really enjoy doing so. The sketches aren't always very helpful for me in terms of making a painting because I'm not very good at drawing. I'm not very accurate. Um, I think I, I'm just a bit impatient. Um, so um, it's helpful in that I really enjoy spending time in the space and it helps me look. And a lot of painting is about observing and noting things. So it, it kind of um, gets you into the right, right frame of mind. Um, what was the second part of that question, Phoebe? Sorry, I forgot. Um, it was just about whether, um, well, it was, I sort of added it on, but just whether the experience of being there also adds to the painting um, when you bring I, it back to the studio. Yes, I believe so. Um, I, I've never worked from found images or someone else's images. And the actual end result might not look any different, um, but it feels very, very different to me. I, um, I, I guess I'm painting them because I admire them and I, um, and I appreciate them. So to take that out of the process is something that I don't really want to do. Mm. But I also, while I'm painting them, I am remembering having been there and what it was like and what I was thinking about. Great. Should we carry on and then I'll ask the others? Sure. Sounds good. So next, I'm going to bring the painting over here. I mean, the reference photograph. Next, I'm going to do this um, section here in the foreground, the large area of green. And I'm going to just wipe away a little bit of the paint here. I forgot to say that the palette is obviously one of the materials as well, but my palette is my table, my painting table. So I work on a very large piece of glass, but a paper plate, piece of cardboard, disposable palette, anything will do. Um, sorry. <laughs> Someone just ask if I, if um, we could just possibly flip to the source image from time to time. So I'm just sure. going to bring that up on the screen. Yeah. Or Louis is just going to bring that up on the screen if that's okay. So there's the source image as well. Thank you. So um, I'm mixing up a bit of the lemon yellow, white, um, the emerald green, and I'm going to just very quickly put it over the top of that section. And having said, doesn't matter if the river goes down underneath. I can actually see it's coming through slightly, but that's all right. Everything can be corrected later. So just a note from, uh, while we've got this shared, um, at the top of your screen, you can choose side by side view. So you can sort of uh, decide how big you want uh, Hannah's painting and the source image. So you can look at both at the same time. Do let us know if anyone's having any issues with that, but hopefully we can look at both together. So I've painted this um, this particular reference image a few times in preparation for this workshop, and every time it comes out differently. Um, and you know, another painter might paint it, and it would be the same or have more similarities. But I think I'm quite emotional when I'm painting. Depends what mood I'm in. Some days go better than others. There are some days when the painting seems to just paint itself and it's this glorious thing of almost watching it happen, but those are very rare. And there are some days when it's, um, I don't wanna say a struggle, but it's just, it doesn't work as well. It's just, um, you know, it's um, not as fluid. So I'm hoping today will be a good day. <laughs> <laughs> it's looking good so far. Thank you. <laughs> We had a question earlier just about what colours you're using for the sky. Oh yes, sorry, I didn't, don't know if I went through that, did I? Um, my apologies. I used white with some yellow okra 
the lemon yellow and the tiniest, tiniest tip or um, bit of crimson. And so um, I literally just, if you can see that, just dip the one corner, like a millimeter of the brush into the crimson and mix it around to make a peachy color. And someone's also asked about, um, do you always use those particular acrylics, the System 3 ones, um, or do you think it, more expensive paint makes a difference? Um, I don't use, I do use these sometimes. Um, I tend to use a brand called Lascaux, which um, is more expensive, um, but um, I like the, the color range that it comes in. Um, but there's not a huge difference, to be honest, I don't think. I mean, someone else might say that there is, but for me, um, these, these acrylics work very well. So, and they are often in my acrylic set, particularly the burnt umber, which I don't have, it didn't come with this set, but it's really beautiful, lovely, rich brown color. I wouldn't, in, I wouldn't spend too much on art materials um, at first, I think it's, um, unless of course you can afford to and it doesn't matter, the cost doesn't matter. But um, I think the more you paint, the more you find out which colors or which um, types of materials you might want to invest in. And then I add them onto the Christmas list. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I'm in my forties. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Okay, so the next stage is, if you're all ready, if you're not, let me know and I can answer some more questions. But the next stage is to paint the tree line. So I'm going to be painting this line here, ignoring the trees that stick out. So the main bulk of the trees. And for this, I'm choosing a brush, which is slightly smaller. Um, and it will be with um, burnt umber mixed with emerald for this. So a warm, a warm dark green. More water on the brush. Oh, I put it in the blue by accident. Oh well. So now it's a bluey green. Bluey, browny. Actually, that's not right. I'm going to rinse that out. <laughs> we did just, I, have you mentioned this comment briefly that uh, how empowering for Hannah to give us permission to not be literal in our, our interpretation? Interesting to see the colours she prefers to use. Right. <laughs> just given that. Sorry, I don't know if I caught everything you just said. Um, oh, sorry, it's a bit quiet sorry. from the microphone. Uh, it was just, it was just uh, um, someone had, had said that it was really empowering to see how, um, how like uh, you give uh, give us permission to not be too literal in our in our interpretation of the landscape. So yes, no, I don't. I think you can be as literal as you want to be, and have you know, have a lot of freedom to change things. So I'm going to start working along the, the tree line. Um, this is the bit that is really not exact. Each time I do it, it would probably look very different. Ideally, if you want to you know, copy it a bit more, you're looking for a point there and how it relates to the foreground. So to keep that in mind, but I don't think you have to worry about it too much. I could do with that being a little bit greener. And 
And you can use different colors in here, start sort of picking them up on the brush and um, adding them in on the surface a little bit. And then if you've picked up a lighter color, but you want it to be darker, just rinse out the brush because um, otherwise it might be a bit too muddy. And then add in the, the tree in the corner. And I think it, it doesn't really matter whether it's quite right or not, but there's something quite nice about a confident line. So even if it's not looking like the source image, I think just go with it. Just, yeah. Um, unless, you know, you, it's really not quite what you want, in which case you can paint over it. Mm -hmm. um, so now that I've got that, I'm going to start filling in the area um, down to the water and the foreground. And while I'm doing that, there'll be some points um, like this clump of grass here, which is much lighter. So I will leave that blank to fill it in later. But largely speaking, we're doing the dark areas first and then you add the lighter areas later. Well, that's how I do it, light areas later. So the darkest point of the image is where the river is meeting the trees and going around the bend, where we don't actually have very much information in the image. So that bit can be done pretty dark. If anyone wants us to put the source image on at any point, just let us know on the chat. Um, we've also had just a, um, some other questions come in um, a bit earlier, just saying, love your color choices. Um, and have you ever used traditional blues for sky and water? And are there any other, other, other artists that have inspired your color palette? Oh, such good questions. Um, I do use blue. I use cobalt blue and ultramarine blue um, and... Uh, quite a lot of blues I can't pronounce, which is a bit embarrassing. Um, I'm not going to try. <laughs> um, and as far, as far as inspiration for color palette, I really love the Swiss and Norwegian landscape painters of the 19th century. Um, for their really rich, vivid colors and Dutch landscape painters. Um, and I've been looking a lot at Constable recently um, because um, it's kind of hard to ignore such a <laughs> big name when you're painting landscapes. Um, I did realize my, I had a list of what to do and the next thing to do was to paint the sticking out trees but I don't think that matters which way around we do this. So. Did I answer all those questions? Sorry, I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, you did. Okay, just, um, someone else was just um, commenting on how confident you are with your brush strokes and what do you do if you go wrong? I know you spoke about this a bit, but what do you do if you go wrong? Um, if you go wrong, you could try wiping it off if it's still wet or you wait for it to dry and you paint over it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you might think you've gone wrong, but actually you carry on painting and it's not such a big deal and it looks fine. So I think um, if you feel it wasn't quite what you want, wait and see whether you want to correct it later on is, is my advice. This, the water I'm using is, you can see now it's really pond-like. So I'm going to get rid of that. <laughs> We're also just going to flip to the source image for someone who'd like to see it. And for anyone, you can um, split the screen so you can still see Hannah's work if you just slide the line in the middle to the um, to the middle. <laughs> so there's, there's a line between um, Hannah's painting and the source image, and you can drag it so you can um, see the. That both images at the same size. 
Interesting. Each time I paint this image, it gets darker. <laughs> um, the one when I first did it, that looks a bit more cheerful than the one <laughs> today. And that was yesterday's. Um, and I don't know why that happens, but I tend to go towards a dark color palette. <laughs> But we can um, we can try and cheer it up a bit at the end. So it's amazing how much paint you can go through doing such a small painting. So I have to keep squeezing out some more paint. And do you listen to music whilst you paint, or do you have other things that help you focus whilst painting? Um, asks someone. That's a great question. I don't listen to music at all. Um, I listen to Radio 4 all day, unless there's a um, test match special on. <laughs> <laughs> so if there's cricket, I'll listen to cricket, and if not, Radio 4. Um, sometimes podcasts, so sometimes I listen to interviews with other artists. I did for a while try and do my German practice while I was in the studio, but I was just, I wasn't engaging at all. I was just pretending I spoke German and I don't. So, um, <laughs> right, so what am I doing? Oh, that's nice. I've got the source image on my screen now. Excuse <laughs> me. Like, How did that get there? <laughs> <laughs> it's much lighter than the one that I've got. It's, it's actually a, a nicer reference point of for me. Um, right, so I'm going to fill in this bit, stop talking, fill in this bit down here. Um, so I'm looking for the darker areas and then put in some lighter bits. And having said I'd leave an area light, I didn't, I forgot. So um, I'd, I'd guess that would count as going wrong, particularly as I as I said it as an instruction. So that's a good example. You can just paint over it. That's, I, that's why I love painting so much. You are just the author of your own universe. You just change whatever you want to change. Um, So the next bit is to paint the trees that are going upright, these ones. If you want to, you might think, actually, I don't want to paint any of those bits going into the sky. Um, if you're not using this image, it would be any bits that are um, in the distance that you might want to paint that reach the sky or that part of the image. And I'm going to choose a smaller brush for this. Um, if I can find one that hasn't been treated badly. <laughs> We've just had another question just saying, I love your paintings, but do you ever feel the temptation to verge into the abstract when painting landscape? Like for example, Ivon Hitchens. I love I Ivan Hitchens. Um, I do feel tempted and sometimes I test it out and some of those are um, hidden around the studio. Um, so yes, but I can't seem to not add more information because part of what makes me want to paint these is the, the view. So, um, the longer answer is um, is no, really. <laughs> but the temptation is there, definitely. Actually, I don't know if that was the long. That's that was a, <laughs> quite a contrary answer. <laughs> yes, I am tempted to. <laughs> so, just putting a few trees here. I don't know if you ever watch Bob Ross painting tutorials. I always think of the happy trees. <laughs> happy trees. 
you know him. Yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I've, I've watched them, but never actually painted along with him. Ashamed. I have an Ivor, actually. I should try that. Yeah. Just um, sometimes have his voice in my head. We'll put the um, painting back on for a moment. Okay, and I've um, I've realised that I've rinsed my brush out in the clean pot, as I said I probably would do by accident. So I'm just going to fix that. It's probably got around um, five to ten minutes now. Okay, I will speed up. Mm -hmm. Sorry. No, yeah, that's fine. It's all the questions that are coming in. <laughs> I'm distracting myself. <laughs> Very good at it. <laughs> um, put these trees in. That was maybe a little bit muddier than um, I would have hoped. So sometimes with trees, it's useful to sort of go for the main um, trunk and then work around it. I tend to only paint views when the leaves are on the trees because that's what I prefer. Um, so I'm getting near to the end of my season that I would be sketching. As soon as the clocks change, I pretty much stop photographing. And why is that? Um, because autumn's coming. Um, and there's less trees on the, le less leaves on the trees. So I tend to mostly take most of my source images between May and October. Maybe one day I'll paint winter, but at the moment I don't paint winter scenes. <laughs> um, so I can see from the image on the screen that this foreground here is really jumping out. It doesn't look like it's relating to the other bits at all. So now that we've done the main areas it's a case of tweaking and trying to change bits that don't work so well add more information where you want to add details or highlights maybe put in a few little bits of purple or red to set it off a bit and this bit is the bit that takes longer um, and you can spend much more time on it if you wish so the first thing I'm going to do is try and fix this area at the front. And use a clean, soft brush. Maybe it needs a little bit, because the painting's so dark, maybe it needs a bit of brown in it to start relating. Um, And I'm going to put in the parts here that go over, over the water in the hope that it no longer looks so disjointed. And the large clump there of um, nettles and brambles Just a little bit at the top, the light hitting of where those plants might be. And maybe that looks a bit better. The next part that I can see on mine, it doesn't quite relate, is the area here. So I think that needs to be darker to set it back a bit. So this is the sort of push and pull stage of a painting where you, you to and fro and you, you test stuff out and think, will it look better like this? Um, and the way to answer that question is to, to try it.
So we have come up to quarter two now, Hannah, but um, if everyone who's attending is happy, I think we're happy to carry on for another 10 or 15 minutes. If, if okay, you... great. Um, so anyone who, uh, with us, the, the session is being recorded, so you can catch up later if you do need to leave, but um, otherwise we'll, we'll just carry on painting, I think. I'm very sorry I've overrun. No, no, it's been, it's been <laughs> very nice. Not a problem at all. Um, someone just said, yes, please longer. And yes, please carry on. <laughs> so okay, great. People want to stay, so <laughs> that's lovely. It's good to get feedback immediately. So now I'm putting in um, some of those lighter parts that I said I would leave room for and forgot. Um, and I think I need to just move brush the brush than that. That's a bit clunky. <laughs> Hannah, do you ever feel like um, time runs away with you when you're painting? Absolutely. It's, it's wonderful. <laughs> I can lose hours. Um, I'm, I'm pretty bad with time, generally. Um, I'm getting better, but yes, I absolutely. Time just seems to have a different different logic in the studio. <laughs> we don't norm, not always join in with the, with the uh, sessions. Um, so normally I have my eye on the time. So this time it has <laughs> <laughs> surprised me all the way <laughs> And someone's just said, would you edit something out if it, it becomes too complicated to paint as, it, as in danger of ruin the, ruining the painting? And because, was that, would I miss it out? Yeah, would you yes. edit something out? Because you start to focus on the detail too much, but it is an integral part of the view. Um, I, I would definitely miss it out. Um, and if it's, if it's, I guess if it's an integral part of the view, I guess it depends if that matters for you personally, because someone else might not know that it is. So, but yeah, I think miss out, edit out anything you don't want. <laughs> okay. That's what I do. Um, so now, um, now it's the case of adding highlights. So the lighter parts, the bits, a um, bit more information. Um, so some areas are a bit too wet to do this by so by trying to do this i might be making it a little bit muddy by adding it mixing it on the surface but you can start putting in um the areas where the light is hitting the trees to give it a bit more form um and to start differentiating between different trees, different areas of the of the image um, to bring some areas forward more and let other areas go back. We've just had someone ask them, um, how do you know when a painting is finished? Because um, they think that they always overwork images. That's another really good question. With the paintings that um, take longer, so like the painting behind me, or the small oil on board paintings I make, it's, it's finished when I can't really bear to do it anymore. Um, I just think that I won't, I won't be adding anything. Mm. Um, but having said that, if it sits around in the studio, if there's an opportunity to, to tinker with it, I probably will. And I'll, I think it's finished and, and I'll, I know when, I stop when they're 98% there. And then there's just those extra little tweaks that take time to decide what to do. So I'm not sure how helpful that was, sorry. No, it's very helpful. I think stop when it's nearly there. <laughs> and I find um, one way of knowing if something is, if it's complete, whether it's balanced, the composition and whether it sits together as an image is to take a photograph of it and then by looking at it as an image rather than at as, as a painting so looking at it on a screen it 
it gives you a bit more objectivity. You can be removed from it. Um, and you can immediately sometimes see something that you'd like to change, but you can't, I don't see it so readily being next to the painting. Um, I know other artists work with a mirror um, behind them, so they're viewing it in reverse. And so that's another way of seeing it in a, with a fresh eye. So by this point of the painting, we'll all be doing different things, mm -hmm. adding highlights here and there, offsetting areas. Thinking about what needs to be done or not. I think another answer to when, if you know if it's to know when it's finished, just to have a cup of tea mm. and just sit down for a bit. Mm. Would that be having a cup of tea and, and looking at the painting or have a cup yes. of tea away from it? Well, either. Sometimes just walking away really helps, but I think having a break mm. um, and moving away from it because there, there's a tendency to just to keep working otherwise, but it, you might not be, like I'm doing now, you might not actually be helping <laughs> the image. Wonderful. <laughs> So I think we're nearly there. Yeah. So if anyone has any closing comments or questions for Hannah, um, we'll have a couple of minutes just to say those things um, that I'll pass on to Hannah and then I'll hand back over to Lucy for the closing remarks. Okay, thank you. I don't think that bit I just did was helpful, so I'm just going to try and get rid of that. We've just um, had a comment from Rachel Brown saying, well done, <laughs> I really enjoyed this. I have a feeling you might know each other. <laughs> I do. Hello, Rachel. <laughs> That's my wonderful sister who actually studied painting, whereas I didn't. So. <laughs> um. And we've just had another comment saying, would love to see the three paintings together, which I think are the, the other two paintings you did yesterday yeah. and the day before. And great workshop. Thanks so much. Thank you. So one of the, the last thing I do, this is the most enjoyable bit sometimes, is to pull the masking tape off. Um, you can still fiddle with it afterwards, but I'm just doing this because we're reaching the end of the workshop. And by having masked it off, by having the border around it, I think it helps the image. It just gives it, um, what does it give it? A bit of space or, um, I think basically, I suppose what I'm trying to say is I think it just looks better with a border <laughs> around it. I was looking for the right words. <laughs> and then I, I trim that part there. No. Oh, should I put the ones from the other day? Yeah. Yeah, we can see those. Yeah. See if we can see them together. Um, I might have to hold the camera up. Do you want to do it on the? Oh no, that's good. Um, this one I didn't finish. This one I really didn't finish. <laughs> should, I, should I take the camera off the thing and hold it up, or would that be really annoying? Um, no, I think that'd be that'd be nice. Okay. Yeah. That so yeah. huge variations. Mm. And it, yeah, it's so interesting that that's all the same from the same source image, but they're very different. 
And you said that that sort of depends on your mood as well. Yes, I think it does. I think I um, sort of set off in one direction and then the painting, um, I choose to go along with it and I, I find, sort of see where I end up. And obviously I could choose to um, do it a bit slower or be more disciplined in relating to the source image. But what I like about making quick sketches is that they aren't exact copies of the image, that they, um, they have a bit more freedom in them. And yes, sometimes they just turn out a bit differently. Mm -hmm. um, with this one, I think I spent a little bit more time on it. I added a branch going across, cutting across mm -hmm. from the right, because I thought that helped the image. So some of those decisions that will happen quite instinctively will help me when I'm making the painting. We've just had someone say, really inspiring workshop. We'll, we'll be re-watching this, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. No, it was absolutely um, a real pleasure to have you leading this workshop today, Hannah. It was absolutely amazing. And me and Louis have been doing our own little- Oh, fantastic. We had quite a yellow printer, so ours have come out a bit yellow. It's been great to see this. They're wonderful. Bit splodgy. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's been a really nice bit less refined. It's been, it's been oh, and Lucy's. Lucy's gone. Oh, Lucy's, yeah. oh wow. Red, red. Expressionistic. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Hannah. It's been absolutely brilliant. And um, I just loved all of the questions that have come in and everyone is really engaged. So thank you so much. Um, and we're definitely on <laughs> running over time now. So I'm going to quickly hand over to Lucy, who's going to say the, um, the closing remarks. So thank you, Hannah. Thank you so much. Oh yeah, that was fantastic. That was really fantastic. And I don't know whether we've got our wires crossed, but I thought we weren't finishing until three anyway. So I was oh. like, yes, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so that was perfect. And um, thank you so much everyone who came this afternoon. And um, it's actually really, that was so nice seeing Phoebe and Louise, um, uh, the work that they'd created in this work. <laughs> in my defense, I only had the colours orange, blue and silver and their fabric paints and a really rubbish brush, so which is why mine looks a little bit uh, unusual. But we would love to see, for those of you that have been um, doing work along with Hannah, we would absolutely love to see your work. So in the next day or two, we'll send an email round um, with a Dropbox link. So if you have done any pictures or if it, even if you don't come, if you want to come back to it or you rewatch this video again on the Make Your Mark website or our YouTube channel and redo it, please any work that you make in response to this workshop and any of the others do please send them to us. We'd absolutely love to see them. Um, and we will be putting together a bit of a gallery of all the work that's been made from all the different sessions over Make for Tomorrow. Um, so it'd be great if you're up for it, we can, we can put your work in that, which would be wonderful. But yeah, Hannah, thank you so much. That was, what a beautiful, way to spend the afternoon i hope everyone who's attended has enjoyed it as much as we have thank you so much everyone for coming for giving your time engaging taking that risk of creativity it can be daunting sometimes so yeah well done it's been really really good um so yes that is it we're up to three o'clock now so that's it for this afternoon um so i just do have a couple more thanks to say so uh want to say a big thank you to heads on so heads on our um sussex partnership trusts charity so they fundraised for us to make the whole of the make for tomorrow program happen um and our funders our wonderful funders our arts council england and nhs charities together so all of this we want to say a big thank you to them for making making all of this possible so there's more events coming up tomorrow afternoon if you haven't seen it or you haven't booked please go and have a look and please do book we've got the amazing writer um Marianne, oh my days, I nearly forgot her name for a minute. Marianne Keys is going to be doing a live conversation. Um, if you've not come across her, give her a little Google or ask someone who might know a bit about her. She's an amazing writer. She's written about all sorts of very human things. She's a, a really dynamic and vivacious character. So she'll be having a chat about what it's like to be a writer and about some of those things. And it's live. And so the same with this, you can type your questions into the chat box. So put the kettle on, get a cup of tea and come and join us for that. Um, and then there'll be another talk next week. Um, 
with the amazing actress Imogen Stubbs. So but just keep going to the Make Your Mark website, find out what's coming up. There's new things being announced all the time. We're having a little pause from our usual Tuesday afternoon ones next week, but we will be back the following week. So yeah, just keep an eye on the website to see, what, see what's coming up. But yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Phoebe and Louie and all the wonderful folk at hospital rooms. Um, it's been a really fabulous afternoon and we hope to see you soon. So that's it from us all. Bye for now, everyone. Bye. Okay, thank you. <laughs>